Go ahead, grab your Bibles out real quick. Here physically, even online, I want you to get your Bible out. I want you to open up to 1 John. And we're gonna set the atmosphere for what I believe God is gonna speak into our hearts and align in our minds as we come around what God has for us. In fact, it's in 1 John. I'm gonna go ahead and read from chapter four. Let's go from verse 12. This is like our series Scripture. John writes this, No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and His love is brought to full expression in us. God has given us His Spirit as proof that we live in Him and He in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Saviour of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we've put our trust in His love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. We live like Jesus here in this world, in this world. Look at your neighbour and say, in this world, in this world. I'm excited for the Word of God today. And we started last Sunday with a subject, saved but still struggling. And I thought that that went down so well, we'd stay along that theme. And, and I decided today that I wanna speak to you from the subject, choose your struggle. Choose your struggle. And I believe God's gonna use this powerfully in your life if you let it, amen. Amen. So as you prepare your hearts for the Word of God, find 10 people around you, hug them and say, welcome to San Jose. Do it real quick, do it real quick, go. Thanks worship team. Thanks for going to level three. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Can we go ahead and welcome online real quick? Our online campus. So amazing to have them on and it's great to be in our San Jose campus today broadcasting from here. I'm just trying to get a look at you while they bring out my teaching aid because I know that you can't concentrate on Jesus Christ while there's something happening on stage. I know this, I know you, I know, I know my church and it's just too much of a distraction. And uh, how many people, real quick, quickly, can I ask this question? How many people would consider themselves to be an optimist? Anybody here? Okay, I'd hope more for a room full of believers, you know, but, <laughs> but regardless, I'm happy. There's one more time. Anybody here an optimist? And I know why you're hesitant to put your hand up because optimists annoy you, don't they? I, I know, same for me, most of the time, you know, when, when there are some days when you don't feel optimistic, you know, there are those days where you just feel like having a bad day. You feel like having a down day and you feel like complaining and it's right, Barish, you know what I'm talking about, right when you wanna complain, it's right in the moment where someone tries to turn it for good. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like right when you wanna be like just down about something, frustrated with the rain, upset at the traffic and you start talking about life, they, they always have a way of saying, yeah, but. And you're like, don't come at me with your butts. I just wanna have a down yeah. moment. That's right. And it's annoying, it's annoying. In fact, there's something that happens in our household where because uh, just recently I shared this. In fact, I've been sharing this a little bit. My wife was out of town. She was away for two weeks, man. Like that's a long time especially when you're a team. And, and, and I like to think that we're a team. I found out that she uh, really carries our team, especially in the school drop-off area of life. And we've got this thing where, where our daughter's schools are at vast ends of the city. And uh, I don't know why they do this, but the times mean it's very tricky. You have to literally be like a Formula One driver to get to school drop-off on time. And so it was my duty just to get the kids to school get them there on time, get them dressed, get them fed. And I thought, you know what? I'm not just gonna do dad game well, I'm gonna do it better. Yeah. I am gonna one up my wife. And, and not only am I gonna get them to school, I had this whole plan, I'm gonna stop past Starbucks. Yeah. yeah, and they're gonna walk into school with those peppermint hot chocolates. Yeah. And all their friends are gonna be like, they're, they're parents, man. <laughs> they, got, they got some parents. 
However, on route to school, uh, we pulled up to this set of traffic lights. The, the traffic was particularly heavy and I had to go into a left-hand lane to swing past Starbucks. I don't usually go this route because it wasn't on the way, but I was going to go past Starbucks. And, and, and I saw a gap that I thought was big enough However, I blame the person in front of me for stopping too short. You know, you got a gap in front of you, you got to make that gap up, amen. Anyway, we kind of squeezed through and it felt like a bit of Morse code on the side of the car <laughs> that kept going. You know, it wasn't like one little bump. I just felt like the whole way, this sound that kept scraping all along four panels of the car. I'm not too proud of that. And I remember my girl's faces, I could see the guy in the car like freaking out and, and we, we pulled over and we took care of business and did all that kind of thing. And I was pretty upset about it, I was pretty frustrated. I'm like, man, I can't believe I did that. I'm a good driver, come on. <laughs> I'm like beating myself up. And I'm like, man, I'm so bummed about this. I'm just having a moment, you know what I mean? And because my girls live with a preacher, they, they said, dad, it's okay, you know why? I said, why? They said, at least you got a preaching illustration from it. <laughs> So annoying. So annoying. But you know, we kicked off this series unpacking why it is that I can be saved yet still struggling. And through deepening our understanding of Jesus as Savior, we realized that a Savior is different from a superhero. We discovered that as a superhero that swoops in and takes you out of this world, God's plan while He does swoop in at your moment of need, His plan is not to take you out of this world because if He took you out of this world, you would have zero effect on this world. Instead, the way God works is not as a superhero, but as a Saviour, which means that He steps into your world and through your world, He has effect through you, regardless of what's going on in your life, regardless of the struggles, that's the way God works so that we can be a part of His plan for the world. And so what we found, and if maybe this is okay with you, we did a little Bible study last week. I thought we would take it next step and we'd do a devotional today. Is that okay? A devotional that will deepen our understanding of Jesus as Saviour. I was speaking, I had the privilege last night of speaking uh, to the San Francisco 49ers. I did their chapel for them. So they're gonna win today, amen. In Jesus' Name. If they win, I get an invite back, amen. So. If they lose, whatever. So, so, and I told them growing up in church, I knew that a quick sermon was a good sermon. So we're gonna do a quick sermon today, amen. But what I find and what you'll find is evident as we study God's Word in reflection to our own life is our amazing human ability to get stuck and need a Saviour. Right, we have this uncanny ability as humans to go through life and time and time again, get ourselves into a situation or a place where we find that we're stuck and we need help. A season that, that, that reoccurs in our life like a bad dream where we end up getting out of a mess, out of a pickle, out of a situation, only to find ourselves in another situation needing Saviour again because we're, we're stuck. In fact, we can see this through the Bible, not just in our lives. As we track with the Israelites, and as they walk through life, you will see a pattern or a cycle with the Israelite nation that is indicative of our walk with God, where constantly we come across the same situations generations later, only to find ourselves stuck and in need of a Saviour. And when you read the Word of God, you can almost use the Word of God like a mirror that will illuminate to you like it does through some of the biblical heroes, their weaknesses, and will connect them with the same ways that you are weak. In fact, you'll find this as you read through the Word of God, you're gonna find that there are different ways that the Bible reveals weaknesses. Even from the very beginning, in fact, we see that Adam gave in to peer pressure. Then we see that Eve couldn't really control her appetite. We see Cain, the firstborn human being, uh, was murdered and he, mur sorry, he murdered his brother, that's bad. Abraham lied about his wife, said that she was his sister to save his own skin. Noah got drunk, Jacob was a deceiver, Leah was ugly. Moses <laughs> stuttered and was shy. Rahab was a prostitute. Samson had a serious problem with women. Gideon was weak. Jonah ran from God and David was the Lord's beloved, yet he had an adultery and killed her husband. Jonah, we saw where we got Isaiah, he preached naked. Zacchaeus was short. Peter had a temper and denied Jesus. 
Timothy, we know, was timid. Thomas was a doubter and the disciples were dysfunctional. Martha worried too much. Mary was lazy too often. And poor old Lazarus was dead way too long. And that's without talking about the fact that Paul was a murderer. And this infamous list of biblical heroes are our examples to live by. So it makes me wonder if there is some connection between their significance and their struggle. I wonder if there's a connection that we could draw from today. In fact, while the Bible certainly has a number of of significant heroes, it also has a number of significant stories and some pivotal points in the journey that we can draw from. In fact, last Sunday, we identified one of the most pivotal points in Scripture, the, the moment where Peter had the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. Such a pivotal, powerful moment that, that even what we see today is a result of that moment. That Jesus said, upon this revelation, I will build my church. Go ahead and look around real quick. Look around at you. Even if you're online, you didn't even know what Jesus was talking about, that we'd have church online. Well done, Peter. We're gonna have church online because of you. The church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. This was the revelation, the foundation upon which the church began. And so we see these pivotal points. I'm gonna bring up my teaching screen. We've got these pivotal moments in Scripture that are defining moments. And if we were to go to the most pivotal one, not really the centre of the Bible, but the centre of the story, so to speak, we would know that the most pivotal moment in all of Scripture is the death, burial, resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Amen. That is the central centrifugal access point. That is the point which everything is built from, that centres around that point that makes Jesus Saviour in our life. A monumental moment, in fact, well, actually, I'm trying to calm down because I'm doing a devotional, aren't I? I'm not preaching. Let me bring it down five levels. A moment that was prophesied about. A moment that had been realised through the freeing of humanity from sin's penalty and at the same time identified through really the release of power that's connected to our purpose. In fact, I like the way Paul puts it. Paul puts it like this in Romans 6 verse 5. He says, since we have been united with Him in His death, we will also be raised to life as He was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. I like that. He said we were set free from the power of sin. This is important to know and in fact foundational to our understanding that when Christ came into our life, we were set free from some things. From some things. I don't like that. From some things. From, we were set free <laughs> from some things. We were set free from before your life with Christ, there were things you struggled with in fact. Probably struggled with guilt, shame, lust, self-worth, anxiety. We could list a whole list of things that we struggled with before Christ came into our life. There was a there was a struggle. In fact, we even had this struggle with sin. We were stuck in sin. Not only were we struggling with sin, we were struggling with the sentence of sin. But yet Jesus came and literally saved us from the penalty that was due to us because of the sin in our life. This is great foundational understanding, amen. This is really good basis when you're doing a devotional. But while Jesus saved us from death, Jesus takes it a whole nother step. And now that Christ is in our life, Paul Paul says something incredible. In fact, let me read it to you. He says in verse seven, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And then he goes on to say this in verse eight. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. So not only did God save us from something, Paul makes sure that we know He saved us for something. This is really important to know, especially when your devotional time, you need to know what I got saved from or what I got saved for, because I got saved for some things. I got saved for a future. I got saved for a purpose. I got saved for a reason. I got saved for significance. And this makes for great preaching. I mean, this is great preaching. You wanna preach, you wanna get a lot of amens, preach this stuff. What you say for? Like, like get some real good solid amens. But if we were to take into consideration just for a moment, considering Paul's conversion experience, we may just be a little bit surprised on what it is that we're saved for. In fact, let's go, we're going devotional. So let's open our Bibles, go to Acts chapter nine. 
Because here we just see that Jesus arrested, literally arrested Paul on the road to Damascus and saved him from his old life. This is where he literally changed his name to, from Saul to Paul. And what's unexpected, however, in this process is the description of what Paul was saved for. Check it out. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. It says, Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man, named, a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him in a vision, uh, uh, shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorised by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now we like verse 15. In fact, verse 15 gets a lot of preaching time. Gets a lot of pulpit time, get a lot of air time, verse 15. Because verse 15 talks about chosen instrument. Verse 15 talks about take my message. Verse 15 talks about kings and the whole nation. And that's good to preach. I mean, I get up here and I will talk about how you are a chosen instrument of God, a royal priesthood. God has called you. God has set you apart. God has sent you out. You will be before kings, before government, before influencers. It's easy to get an amen. But if I talk about how you're gonna suffer, <laughs> no amens for that. No amens. Let's go back to verse 15 because that's nice. But verse 16, yeah. verse 16 doesn't get a lot of pulpit time. Yeah. Preachers don't like verse 16. Some I got to tell people that signing up to Jesus means you're going to struggle. <laughs> In fact, what we look for and what we love to preach is we love to go, we go from strength to strength. Yeah. We go from glory to glory. But we preach that without knowing exactly what that means. Because it's not me going from strength to strength, like all I ever do is win, 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 no matter what. No, 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 no. What, what he's saying is he's saying you go from your strength to God's strength. You go from glory about you to glory about God. And the process through which that happens is through my weakness. Because it's when I get to the end of myself and my weak point that I realise I can't do this in my strength. I need His strength. So we see with Paul, Paul had struggles. Paul had struggles. I mean, on the surface, Paul looked like he had it all together. If you know anything about Paul, he, he, he looked pretty clean, man. He looked like he was, he was the man. He, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a shining example of someone in ministry. And so on the surface, it might be hard to pick Paul's struggle before Christ. In fact, that was the whole, that was the whole MO of a Pharisee is to look like there was no struggle. To look no strong. But, but we could even just put one of Paul's struggle out of the many as pride. See, even when you're pretending like you don't have a struggle, pride is your struggle. Pride was this struggle that had Paul. And so we would expect now that he's got Saviour in his life, that he doesn't have a struggle. But what we see in Paul's life is while his struggle before Christ was pride, his struggle after Christ is prison, persecution, pain. And somehow, if I had a choice, I'd choose pride. Don't act like you wouldn't too. Like, I'm going to weigh this up, pre-Saviour pride, post-Saviour pain. I choose pride. But the reason why we see this pattern in Paul's life is because when it comes to Christ, it's not like from our strength to more strength or our glory to more glory. What we see is God takes us from struggle to struggle. In fact, this is what's confusing in the Word of God is like, how is this that Jesus permits this or almost even promotes it, in fact? Because it says He must show Paul how much he must suffer for my sake. Let me show you something because this is gonna be, I, I believe, helpful in, in your life. And last week, if you're part of the sermon, you would understand, we, we looked at the power of interpretation the way we see things. And we used an electrical illustration called Parallax Error. If you didn't get it in the sermon, get it on podcast because it's gonna make a whole lot more sense if you listen to the whole sermon. But we, we identified the idea of Parallax Error that 
By simply changing your perspective or your position, you will see things differently. I thought we could take it one more step and draw from my extensive electrical knowledge today because I was an electrician for a little while, so go with me. And I thought that I could teach you another electrical foundational principle that maybe, help you, maybe will help you in your spiritual understanding. And what I learned as an electrician, for electricity to work, you need something called polarity. That's all I know. You need polarity. Now what polarity is, is positive and negative. Two opposites to create a circuit that will then form and house a flow of electricity. Any electricians here? Any electrical engineers here? Oh, God help us. Okay. Well, what you need for all the electrical engineers is this circuit. Now, a polarity and what you will find when you've got the polarity right, that in that circuit will be a certain flow. The current will flow in a particular direction. And what we learned in electrical school is they would teach us that in this particular flow is a magnetic field. And if you're in this electrical, electromagnetic field, I'm sounding so technical, but I'm fumbling all over it. If, if you have a certain electrical, electrical magnetic field, whatever you call it, in that field and in that flow, if you introduce a particular element, That element, if it's given the right element with a particular coil or in the right way, that perfect element introduced into that field will actually reverse the flow. That it it is called a reverse polarity. Act like you're impressed already, okay? Would you just act like, like, wow. Go with me. Go with me. Because it's fascinating because before Christ is in my life, there is a certain flow. There is a flow in my life where When I have struggles in my life, my struggles have got a flow. And the struggles have a flow that constantly reveal my weakness. Go with me. Write these down. I hope you're writing your own notes today. I hope you're not just banking on taking photos of my notes. (laughs) Don't cheat. Take your own notes. My notes won't get you to heaven. Okay, have your own notes. Jesus will check. (laughs) And what they constantly do is struggles... They expose, they expose weakness. They expose the deficit. They, they expose things in my life. What they expose constantly is my need for a Saviour. Wow. Like, like, like I'm constantly reminded of my need for a Saviour. I'm, I'm constantly reminded of where I fall short, where I can't cut it, where, where I don't meet the mark. That is what's constantly being exposed by my struggle. But like a, like, a, like a polarity reversal, when something is introduced into my situation, there is a possibility of that reverse flow happening in my life, a reverse polarity. So now that Christ is introduced in my life, like a foreign element that comes into my struggle, not taking me out of my struggle, not taking me out of the flow. What happens when Christ stepped into my world and into my struggle, something happened to the positive and the negative ratio. Something happened to the way things began to flow, where, where a flow was going one way, constantly revealing my weakness, constantly exposing the fact that I need a Saviour. I realised that there was another flow where, where, where what was being exposed was now now being revealed. Oh, you better write this down in your notes. And if your husband isn't taking notes, tell him to take his own notes. Stop looking at yours. Because what you will understand is while what was exposed was weakness, what is revealed is strength. Not my strength, but God's strength. The strength of a Saviour. The strength of a God. And when Christ isn't in your life, what's exposed is I need a Saviour. When Christ is in your life, the the flow is reversed and reminds you that I have a Saviour. That I've got a Saviour. That I got someone who is, oh, this is way better preaching and you are applauding, I'm telling you. That's right, we're doing a devotional. Bring it down. It's a, a reverse flow. A reverse flow, a reverse flow, a different way to see it. In fact, I was speaking to a guy recently and, uh, and I was speaking to a guy, he, he was in my youth ministry and what I found in youth ministry is that, you know, young people who go from growing up in church and they go to youth ministry, they get married young. Because, you know, we got Jesus in your life. You realise how this works. You just get married. You know what I mean? You're just going <laughs> to make it work. And, uh, and, and yet, this, in an anomaly, he, he didn't get married. And uh, he, he actually got married a lot later in life. 
And uh, we were just speaking recently, only just recently been married, uh, been married for, for less than 12 months, almost about 12 months. And we were chatting and, and I was asking him, how's married life? And I was a bit surprised by his answer because he says, it sucks. <laughs> All the married people are like, mm-hmm. <laughs> the single people, <laughs> single people are chuckling nervously, like, oh, tell me, tell me it's not true. He's like, it sucks. I was like, whoa, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, because I was single so long, I was pretty set in my ways. He said that I could do whatever I wanted to. I, I could go anywhere I wanted. I spend my money on anything I wanted to. In fact, I could, I could go out on Friday night and I could stay up to 2 a.m. playing Xbox. <laughs> At 40 years old. <laughs> he said, now that I'm married, I have to consult on everything. He's talking about even the little placement of things in the bathroom cause a whole lot of conflict. He's like, I've never experienced conflict. Oh, I've got too many people coming to Jesus right now. He's like, even the fact, he's like, man, now I'm married, there's so much conflict in my life. He's like, before I was married, the struggle was with the constant reminder that I'm single. It's like everywhere I went, I, I was reminded how single I am. Like any family function, any, any wedding, any event, any, any Friday night, I was reminded of just how single I am. Yeah. Now that I'm married, the struggle is there, but the struggle is different. In fact, he said the struggle is, is, is with the way things happen and the, the things that we're going to spend our money on and the things that we're going to do. We are so different to how God brought two different people together, he said, is a surprise. Yeah. But then he said this, he said, Every time, however, I look at my wife, he's reminded that he's married and given the choice, he said he would choose this struggle. Yeah, that sentence caught me, yeah. that he would choose this struggle, like, like, like your struggle is a choice. Wow. Like your struggle is a choice. Like, like so often we go through life thinking that struggle just happens, that I don't get to choose the struggle. But what if I was to present to you today that there is a choice in your struggle? You want to hang on a little bit more? Paul says this, he said, I have a thorn in my flesh. Paul was frustrated. Paul was confused because he was trying to minister for Jesus. Paul was trying to present Jesus He's trying to preach. Paul's trying to do what ministers do. And yet he's like, man, there was this annoying thorn in my flesh. And Paul does not give us any indication in the word what the thorn is for good reason. Because if we knew what Paul's thorn was, we would remove our thorn or disconnect it from the situation. But, but on purpose, Paul doesn't identify the thorn so that whatever is in your struggle that you would say, okay, maybe God could use that too. And so we see that Paul has a struggle. In fact, Paul says three times, I prayed for this struggle to go. Three times, like this was annoying Paul. Three different times as he's ministering, as he's trying to do what God calls him to do. It's so confusing that God wouldn't just take me out and make me a perfect example. But three times, he says, whenever I pray, God said, my grace is sufficient. And I love that we have an apostle or an example that struggled. Because if you thought about it, the fact that if Paul never went to prison, that we would not have the prison epistles. That we wouldn't have the ammunition that we have today or the example that even an apostle of God doesn't have to be perfect. That, that, that the very apostle, the one who wrote most of the New Testament, we find that he was the one who was chewed up, spat out, shipwrecked, bankrupt, beaten, abused, ignored, lonely, left aside, cast aside, rejected by the church at one point. If God can use him, then maybe then maybe I don't have to be perfect and have it all together, but in the midst of my mess, God could use me. Yes. That in the midst of my struggle, that I could choose, I could choose for God not to take me out of the struggle, but I could ask God to use my struggle. Use my struggle, go with me because because check this out, check this out. We see this even with, we even see this with Peter and Peter's revelation moment after the great revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus then reveals, well, now the Saviour has to struggle. And Peter says, hell no. Jesus says, hell yes. <laughs> yes, actually, I've got to go to hell. 
and, and we see that this was the very reason that Jesus came to struggle. He came to struggle. He came to struggle for us and struggle on our behalf to struggle with things that we don't have to struggle with so that he can use our struggle in a greater way. And the choice is yours. Like Jesus, he had a struggle moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where right before he went to accomplish that which he went to accomplish, he had a real struggle. The Bible says he struggled, he prayed. The struggle was so real that he sweat drops of blood. But yet in that struggle, he said something so powerful. He said, not my will, but your will be done. Translated to this sermon, I choose this struggle. I choose for not this struggle to defeat me, but let this struggle define me. And we see that it was Jesus' struggle that defined Him as Saviour. The fact that He took our sins and He took our struggle and that struggle became the very thing that set us free. And so I love the fact that when we choose struggle, then God can use our struggle. As long as I'm ignoring the struggle or pretending like it's not there or trying to get free from it or trying to get, and, and I don't want to stay in the struggle. I'm with you. I'm not trying to advocate. We'll just stay in our mess. No, no, no. I want God to progress us. But while I'm here, God, I don't want to pretend like I'm perfect. I want to be transparent and allow you to work through it. I got to confront it and I got to surrender it. The choice is yours. In fact, can I, as I close, just take you back to the beginning of 2018 for a moment. Can I do that? Can I take you back a year where we started this year? We started this year in a, in a series called Free Slaves. How many people remember that series? That was a year ago. But we learned something. And this is how we tie a whole bow on the end of the year. From the beginning to the end, this is great preaching. I know you got it. I know you saw it. I know you're like, wow, levels, but so good for me. And we see Paul say something and he reveals something to us about our choice. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, he said, don't you realise that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. The fact that you are sucking air on earth means you can have a struggle. Even in the pleasant things of life, even when you pray for sunshine, you risk getting sunburned. And just because life and the world has fallen, there will be a struggle in this world. You can be guaranteed of that. But the choice is yours on how you approach that struggle. The choice is yours on how you use that struggle. The choice is yours where I can, I can choose to ignore it and pretend like I got to have it all together, but that will keep you stuck in the struggle. But the moment you surrender that struggle and you say, God, I allow you to use this struggle. God, I, I prayed for it to go away, but for some reason it's still there. So in the midst of it, what are you revealing to me? Because what was exposed is my weakness, but now you're revealing your strength and revealing that I have a Saviour. And what you allow God to do when you surrender is, is you allow God to show you that His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. Man, I gotta land this thing, so I need you to stand on your feet. Otherwise, I'll keep preaching about the fact that our, His grace is sufficient. That means in every situation and in every circumstance, His grace is sufficient, that His grace is for me. You know what that means? No matter how bad things get, I know it's gonna be okay. No matter how bad things get, I know that God, my God is for me. And if my God is for me, it doesn't matter what circumstances against me because I know that everything is gonna be all right. Everything, I know that everything's gonna be all right. I know that my God is for me. I'm not denying that I don't struggle, but I know that my God is with me. My God is for me. So everything in this life is gonna be all right.